This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 2. The Same to the Same. November 25th. Next day I found my rooms done out and dusted, and even flowers put in the vases by old Philippe. I began to feel at home. Only it didn't occur to anybody that a Carmelite schoolgirl has an early appetite, and Rose had no end of trouble in getting breakfast for me. "'Mademoiselle goes to bed at dinner-time,' she said to me, "'and gets up when the Duke is just returning home.' I began to write. About one o'clock my father knocked at the door of the small drawing-room, and asked if he might come in. I opened the door. He came in and found me writing to you. "'My dear,' he began, "'you will have to get yourself clothes, and to make these rooms comfortable. In this purse you will find twelve thousand francs, which is the yearly income I propose allowing you for your expenses. You will make arrangements with your mother as to some governess whom you may like, in case Miss Griffith doesn't please you, for Madame de Chaulieu will not have time to go out with you in the mornings. A carriage and manservant shall be at your disposal. "'Let me keep Philippe,' I said. "'So be it,' he replied. "'But don't be uneasy. You have money enough of your own to be no burden either to your mother or me.' "'May I ask how much I have?' "'Certainly, my child,' he said. "'Your grandmother left you five hundred thousand francs. "'This was the amount of her savings, "'for she would not alienate a foot of land from the family. "'This sum has been placed in government stock, "'and, with the accumulated interest, "'now brings in about forty thousand francs a year. "'With this I had proposed making an independence "'for your second brother, "'and it is here that you have upset my plans.' Later, however, it is possible that you may fall in with them. It shall rest with yourself, for I have confidence in your good sense far more than I had expected. I do not need to tell you how a daughter of the Chaliots ought to behave. The pride so plainly written in your features is my best guarantee. Safeguards, such as common folk surround their daughters with, would be an insult in our family." A slander reflecting on your name might cost the life of the man bold enough to utter it, or the life of one of your brothers, if by chance the right should not prevail. No more on this subject. Good-bye, little one. He kissed me on the forehead and went out. I cannot understand the relinquishment of this plan after nine years' persistence in it. My father's frankness is what I like. There is no ambiguity about his words." My money ought to belong to his Marquis son. Who, then, has had bowels of mercy? My mother? My father? Or could it be my brother? I remained sitting on my grandmother's sofa, staring at the purse which my father had left on the mantelpiece, at once pleased and vexed that I could not withdraw my mind from the money. It is true, further speculation was useless. My doubts had been cleared up, and there was something fine in the way my pride was spared. Philippe has spent the morning rushing about among the various shops and workpeople who are to undertake the task of my metamorphosis. A famous dressmaker, by name Victorine, has come, as well as a woman for underclothing and a shoemaker. I am as impatient as a child to know what I shall be like when I emerge from the sack which constituted the conventual uniform, but all these tradespeople take a long time. The corset-maker requires a whole week if my figure is not to be spoilt. You see, I have a figure, dear. This becomes serious. Jansen, the operatic shoemaker, solemnly assures me that I have my mother's foot. The whole morning has gone in these weighty occupations. Even a glove-maker has come to take the measure of my hand. The underclothing woman has got my orders." At the meal which I call dinner, and the others lunch, my mother told me that we were going together to the milliner's to see some hats, so that my taste should be formed, and I might be in a position to order my own. This burst of independence dazzles me. I am like a blind man who has just recovered his sight. 
now i begin to understand the vast interval which separates a carmelite sister from a girl in society of ourselves we could never have conceived it during this lunch my father seemed absent-minded and we left him to his thoughts he is deep in the king's confidence i was entirely forgotten but from what i have seen i have no doubt he will remember me when he has need of me he is a very attractive man in spite of his fifty years his figure is youthful he is well made fair and extremely graceful in his movements he has a diplomatic face at once dumb and expressive his nose is long and slender and he has brown eyes what a handsome pair strange thoughts assail me as it becomes plain to me that these two so perfectly matched in birth wealth and mental superiority live entirely apart and have nothing in common but their name the show of unity is only for the world the cream of the court and diplomatic circles were here last night very soon i am going to a ball given by the duchesse de maufrignus and i shall be presented to the society i am so eager to know a dancing-master is coming every morning to give me lessons for i must be able to dance in a month or i can't go to the ball before dinner my mother came to talk about the governess with me i have decided to keep miss griffith who was recommended by the english ambassador miss griffith is the daughter of a clergyman her mother was of good family and she is perfectly well bred she is thirty-six and will teach me english the good soul is quite handsome enough to have ambitions she is scotch poor and proud and will act as my chaperone she is to sleep in rose's room rose will be under her orders i saw at a glance that my governess would be governed by me in the six days we have been together she has made very sure that i am the only person likely to take an interest in her while for my part i have ascertained that for all her statuesque features she will prove accommodating she seems to me a kindly soul but cautious i have not been able to extract a word of what passed between her and my mother another trifling piece of news my father has this morning refused the appointment as minister of state which was offered him this accounts for his preoccupied manner last night he says he would prefer an embassy to the worries of public debate spain in especial attracts him this news was told me at lunch the one moment of the day when my father mother and brother see each other in an easy way the servants then only come when they are rung for the rest of the day my brother as well as my father spends out of the house my mother has her toilet to make between two and four she is never visible at four o'clock she goes out for an hour's drive when she is not dining out she receives from six to seven and the evening is given to entertainments of various kinds theatres balls concerts at homes in short her life is so full that i don't believe she ever has a quarter of an hour to herself she must spend a considerable time dressing in the morning for at lunch which takes place between eleven and twelve she is exquisite the meaning of the things that are said about her is dawning on me she begins the day with a bath barely warmed and a cup of cold coffee with cream then she dresses she is never except on some great emergency called before nine o'clock in summer there are morning rides and at two o'clock she receives a young man whom i have never yet contrived to see behold our family life we meet at lunch and dinner though often i am alone with my mother at this latter meal and i foresee that still oftener i shall take it in my own rooms following the example of my grandmother with only miss griffith for company for my mother frequently dines out i have ceased to wonder at the indifference my family have shown to me in paris my dear it is a miracle of virtue to love the people who live with you for you see little enough of them as for the absent they do not exist knowing as this may sound i have not yet set foot in the streets and am deplorably ignorant i must wait till i am less of the country cousin and have brought my dress and deportment into keeping with the society i am about to enter the whirl of which amazes me even here where only distant murmurs reach my ear 
so far i have not gone beyond the garden but the italian opera opens in a few days and my mother has a box there i am crazy with delight at the thought of hearing italian music and seeing french acting already i begin to drop convent habits for those of society i spend the evening writing to you till the moment for going to bed arrives this has been postponed to ten o'clock the hour at which my mother goes out if she is not at the theatre there are twelve theatres in paris i am grossly ignorant and i read a lot but quite indiscriminately one book leading to another i find the names of fresh books on the cover of the one i am reading but as i have no one to direct me i light on some which are fearfully dull what modern literature i have read all turns upon love the subject which used to bulk so largely in our thoughts because it seemed that our fate was determined by man and for man but how inferior are these authors to two little girls known as sweetheart and darling otherwise renee and louise ah my love what wretched plots what ridiculous situations and what poverty of sentiment two books however have given me wonderful pleasure corinne and adolphe apropos of this i asked my father one day whether it would be possible for me to see madame de stel my father mother and alphonse all burst out laughing and alphonse said where in the world has she sprung from to which my father replied what fools we are she springs from the carmelites my child madame de stahl is dead said my mother gently when i finished adolphe i asked miss griffith how a woman could be betrayed why of course when she loves was her reply renee tell me do you think we could be betrayed by a man miss griffith has at last discerned that i am not an utter ignoramus that i have somewhere a hidden vein of knowledge the knowledge we learn from each other in our random arguments she sees that it is only superficial facts of which i am ignorant the poor thing has opened her heart to me her curt reply to my question when i compare it with all the sorrows i can imagine makes me feel quite creepy once more she urged me not to be dazzled by the glitter of society to be always on my guard especially against what most attracted me this is the sum total of her wisdom and i can get nothing more out of her her lectures therefore become a trifle monotonous and she might be compared in this respect to the bird which has only one cry end of letter two read by kara schallenberg on october twelfth two thousand six in oceanside california